In this lecture, I'm going to be talking a little bit um, more about the area and distance problems. So just to recall um, what we talked about in class, we discussed that the derivative has a connection to the slope of the tangent line and to the instantaneous velocity problem, and that there's a connection between antiderivatives and the area under a curve. In particular, if we have our curve is um, representing velocity, be, there will be a connection to um, area and distance traveled. So if I think about a situation where I'm traveling at a constant velocity, here I have a car that's traveling at this constant velocity of 60 miles per hour, then I can represent that with this horizontal line, um, y equals 60. Now if I'm traveling for two hours, then I can find my total distance traveled by looking at two hours, which is my um, length here, times my height, which is 60 miles per hour. So I see that my distance is going to be equal to my velocity times time, which is this 60 miles per hour times two hours, or in this case, 120 miles. Okay, so you see that this um, distance formula of distance being equal to velocity times time is exactly doing um, the area of this rectangle where time is my um, width and my velocity is my height. Um, but if my velocity is not constant, if I have some function v of t here and I want to talk about my distance traveled between two different points, then I'm going to be talking about a similar problem to what we discussed today where I need to break this up into um, many intervals and look at the area of the rectangle over each interval and sum up the areas of my rectangles to get an approximation to my distance traveled. So I want to look at an example where we do some um, approximations. So um, in this example, we're given the velocities in miles per hour of a car moving along a street highway over a two hour period. Okay. So we're interested in estimating the distance traveled by the car um, during this time period, over the two hour time period, using velocities at the beginning of the time intervals. So we're given multiple time intervals here. Um, each interval has width um, a quarter of an hour. So my first interval here goes from zero to 0.25, the next interval from 0.25 to 0.5, etc. So I'm going to have, um, I think, eight different um, time intervals here. And I want to first um, estimate my distance using velocities at the beginning of the time intervals. So at the beginning corresponds to the idea of left endpoints. So let's see, the, the width of each one of my intervals is going to be 0.25, so I'm always going to be multiplying 0.25 times the velocity. So I can just pull 0.25 out and just be summing um, the velocities at the um, endpoints at the beginning of each time interval. So that means my first time interval, I'm going to be using this. My second time interval, I'll use 50. So um, let's see, this will be v of 0 is 50 I'm going to use. Um, on my second time interval, I'm going to use v of 0 0.25 is 50. So I've got 50 plus 50. Then I'll use 60 and then 60. On the next two time intervals, 55, 65. I'll use 50. And then notice that my last time interval would be from 1.75 to 2, so I'll use 60. Um, 70 is the velocity at the end point, the right end point of the last interval, so that will not get used here. So let's see, I've got 55, 65, plus 50, plus 60. Okay. So we're adding up um, eight different things here. So I'm going to have 0.25 times whatever this total is. I didn't write down the intermediate total. So this ends up giving us 112.5 miles traveled. So this is um, a pretty good estimate. We want to look at um, a couple of the other estimates we might get. Now, if we had more information, um, I could break this up into smaller intervals. That would help me get something more accurate. But here I only have a record of the velocity at these um, quarter hour intervals. Okay. So another estimate here could be using our right um, endpoints or um, the way this is describing it, using the velocities at the end of the time periods. So I still have these intervals, 0 to 0 0.25, 0 0.25 to 0 0.5, 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 0 0.5 to 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to 0 0.5,
0.5 to 0.75, etc. But now I'm going to use a velocity at the ends of the interval. So I'm going to be using um, v of 0.25, which is 50, v of 0.5, which is 60, v of 0.75, which is 60, etc. So just to maybe point this out with a different color, I'm going to be using the uh, values at the ends of the interval. So that'll be these different ones that I'm circling in red. Now with the, that last interval, I'm going to be using the velocity that is at 2. So I'm going to have 0.25 times 50 plus 60 plus 60 plus 55 plus 65 plus 50 plus 60 plus 70. So this ends up giving me an approximation of a excuse me 117.5 miles. Okay, so we see that when we have um, information given to us in a table instead of um, as you know an algebraic equation. Um, you know, we're missing some information. So the best that we can do here is use one of the endpoints of um, each of these um, time intervals, each of these quarter hour long time intervals. Okay, so we've got these two different approximations. So we're going to investigate this a little bit more. Um, and one question that we'll ask ourselves are, um, is, is either one of these two estimates the biggest or the smallest um, estimate given this information? So we want to talk a little bit about what it means to have an upper sum or an upper estimate and a lower estimate. So just in general, when we talk about upper and lower estimates, um, we mean that the, the upper one will choose the, the endpoint in each interval um, that gives us the maximum value we could have over that interval. And the, uh, let's see, grab my other pen here. Um, if we want the lower estimate or the lower sum, we'll choose the endpoint over the interval that gives us the smaller um, value. So one thing that could help um, us in this example is to draw a picture of some of these different points and connect some line segments just to get a, a visual of what we're looking at. So let's see, my intervals go 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.751, 1.25, 1.5, 1.752. 1 so we can just label these on here. Okay, now then at um, zero, I'm at 50, so I'm gonna have to estimate things a little bit. Let's see. So let's say this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 is about what we go up to here. Um, let's see, I said 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, this is 60. Okay, so at 0, I'm at 50. At 0.25, it's also at 50. At 0.5, we're at 60. 0.75, it's at 60. 1 is at 55, so that's between those two. 1.5 is at 65, so that's up a little bit more. 1.5, we're at 50. 1.75 is at 60. And 2 is up at 70. So get a rough, to get a rough idea of my velocity curve, I could connect these with some line segments here. And then I'm roughly trying to approximate the area under, um, under this sort of uh, piecewise curve that I've just drawn. Um, now to talk about the upper estimate, let's say, then over each interval I'm going to pick the endpoint that's larger. Now from 0 to 0.25 they're the same, so it doesn't matter which one I pick. So we'll just say I'm going to pick this one. So for the upper estimate, I'm going to have 0.25, again that's my width of each of these, times 50. Now over the interval from 0.25 to 0.5, I would choose 0.5, which has my height of 60. So I'm going to have plus 60. Over the next interval, 0.5 to 0.75, well I might as well choose 0.75 because it's the same, so I'm going to have plus 60. From 0.75 to 1, my higher value is at 0.75, so I'm going to add 60 again. From, uh, let's see, that was from 0.75 to 1. So I'd be drawing my, my rectangle here, basically. Let's see if we can 
get a picture on here. I was going to choose the larger one here and choose this one. Okay, from 1 to 1.25, I'm going to choose this point. So let's see, at 1.25, that was 65. From 1.25 to uh, 1.5, I'm going to choose that same point because it's the higher one. So here, we're not always choosing the left or the right. We're choosing the one that allows us to get the bigger value. That's how we're going to get the upper estimate. So from 1.5 to uh, 1.75, I'm choosing this point over here. So that's giving me an addition of 60. And then from 1.75 to 2, I choose this endpoint at 2. Okay, so that means that I'm adding 70. So when I do this work, I get my upper sum estimate of 122.5 miles. And then to find my lower estimate, I would go through and do the same process, but at each stage I would be choosing the smaller value. So let's do that in a different color. So from 0 to 0.25, well, I can choose same thing because they're even at that point. So I've got 0.25 times 50. Now on the interval from 0.25 to 0.5, I'm going to choose 0.25, which is a height of 50 to get my smaller value. So I have plus 50 here. On the next interval, 0.5 to 0.75, they're the same. So I'm going to be adding 60. From 0.75 to 1, I'm going to choose this endpoint at 1. So I'm going to be adding 55. From 1 to 1.25, again, I'm going to choose 1 because that's the smaller value. So I'm going to be adding 55 again. From 1.25 to 1.5, I choose 1.5. So that means I'm adding 50. From 1.5 to 1.75, we choose 1.5. So again, adding 50. And then over our last interval, we choose 1.75 to get that smaller height. So I'm going to be adding 60. Okay. So that gives us all of our different values here. And we have a lower estimate of 107.5 miles. Okay. So it turns out for this example, since um, our curve here is not strictly increasing or strictly decreasing, neither the right endpoint estimate nor the left endpoint estimate is an upper or a lower estimate. Um, they're somewhere in between each of these bounds. So this just gives us a little bit more um, information about how these sums work. We're going to talk more about um, the notation involved um, and get into talking about the limits when we look at um, taking n rectangles and letting n go to infinity to get the exact um, area under the curve. Please let me know if you have any questions.